I will talk about sort of some of the human influences um, versus just the background ecology of geology. So I'll talk a little bit more about the marine side, uh, sort of the beaches, and John will talk a little bit more about sort of the upland things that we as humans uh, do has had some lots of pollution sources coming in. All this uh, hard scape that's here, water hits it and runs off into Puget Sound, along with all the stuff that's on the cement. Um, and then the shoreline itself has been hardened or armored as well. So we've done a lot of different things. So in King County, we have less than 2% of our historic estuarine wetlands left. Most of those were filled almost 100, 150 years ago. Things like KVI Marsh, which is the largest salt marsh left in King County, uh, most of those got filled in early because it was a nice flat space. All you had to do was backfill and you could put a building there. So we don't have a lot of these left um, compared to other parts of Puget Sound. Much of the shoreline of downtown Seattle has been filled in. So if you look at this graphic here, the pinkish color or the piece surrounded by this now orange polygon, uh, that area is all fill. Uh, right around 1900, people took hoses, washed it down the hillside of Seattle, made flat spots for development, each street up kind of thing, and washed the material down to create buildable lands out of the mudflats of the Duwamish. We're going to zoom in. So like the stadium's area is all fill. I'm going to zoom in on an area to the north end by Pier 91 and 92. So this is a picture in the upper one is 1977. The 1977 is in the same exact location in the bottom photo as the 2000. And so you can see in front of that now, uh, all that parking lot was added and the boat marina was, the LA Bay Marina was put in. You can see in the upper photo, the trees were next to the shore. You could actually see through the water and see the shallow area. So this had some of those beach habitats, had some shallow habitat, probably some eelgrass right there. Uh, but in the bottom photo, not really much left there in the context from a habitat point of view. It's all deep water now. And so a huge shift. And this is more one of the more recent large scale shifts uh, that was done in the last sort of 50 years. Now, when we talk about overwater structures or dots, one of the reasons or some of the reasons that they're seen as an impact is that one, they cast a fair amount of shade, especially the way we used to make them. And so shade uh, means eelgrass can't grow because eelgrass is a flowering plant, it needs sun. And so that's one sort of big impact. Two, we frequently use creosote when we built the piles. And then juvenile salmon that migrate along the shoreline they don't like going under dense shadows. And so they will go offshore, follow the edge of the sort of dock and then migrate around them. And then you might say, it's so big deal the salmon has to go a little further. The issue is that it goes out into deeper water. And when he goes into deeper water, he experiences many more fish that are much bigger than him and more able to eat him and birds and other things. So it's a problem when they're not, when they're really small they need to find places to hide, and this actually puts them in harm's way much more so. Now, you've probably seen uh, some uh, signs like this across King County, basically saying, you shouldn't swim here. Please don't eat fish or shellfish from these areas. Uh, we have a lot of different sources of sort of toxics and runoff that are not ideal for swimming or shellfish. A few years ago, uh, there was a study done out of the Tacoma area for so Commencement Bay that looked at what different chemicals are found in juvenile salmon that are just sort of rearing in sort of the Commencement area. And this is pretty indicative of everywhere. And so I have this video here. So thanks to contaminated water like this, this glass we got from the Puget Sound, okay, scientists found that those salmon also contain flonase, Aleve, Tylenol, Advil, Benadryl, Cipro, Paxil, Valium, Zoloft, Tagamet, Oxycontin, Darvon, and Lipitor. <laughs> Consult your doctor to see if salmon is right for you. So, um, we show that um, not to necessarily make you feel guilty kind of thing, but partly to just um, our wastewater treatment systems that we have were not set up to screen out pharmaceuticals. Uh, that's, that was never their intent. And so a lot of pharmaceuticals go out into the environment and 
we are animals and the other animals are affected by the pharmaceuticals in many of the same ways. So there's been relatively little study on this so far. Uh, a few studies show like juvenile salmon experiencing some of the antidepressants uh, basically sort of forget about their fear instinct and swim right in front of big fish and don't survive too well, um, sort of make themselves readily available. So I'm not saying this to make us feel guilty about the fact that we all have to go to the bathroom and we don't have sort of the, the systems in place to sort of pull the pharmaceuticals out, but it, per, partly just to let you know that we used to give advice across the United States saying, please flush your medicine down the toilet versus once it's expired. And we are no longer saying that. And what we really want you to do is recycle it. And so if you were to go to medicinereturn.org, you will find a pharmacy or a hospital or some other drop box in your area, generally really close, that will take your medicine. And it's just like a mailbox, like you just plop it in there, close it and you're done. Um, and it is a really great way of making sure that your extra pharmaceuticals don't get into the environment. So you've heard the term shoreline armoring a couple of times. And so we may have been saying, well, what is that? And so shoreline armoring is anything that we as humans have put in the shoreline to really limit erosion. That's the intent of what this is. And so it comes in many flavors. Here is a uh, rock wall, riprap. Uh, they're also called sea walls, revetments. Um, but in this case, this is one that's made out of large boulders, riprap. They also come as like cement walls here or sheet pile metal walls like this one, um, or more of an older style com combination of creosote pilings, these large ecology blocks, and then leftover concrete slabs. All these different things are pretty frequent along the shoreline. A little less frequent is this tire bulkhead um, in the Duwamish. And then uh, there was this nice box spring sort of mattress attempt on Vashon uh, to try and limit erosion. And then there's an infamous car body curve in the Snoqualmie River. Basically, we as humans have thrown just about anything heavy or anything we could think of to try and sort of limit erosion. Across King County, there's about 110 miles of marine shoreline. About 75% of it has been armored. Most of that occurs on the mainland portion of King County versus Vashon Mori, but a large portion of it has been armored. So, okay, so what, why do we care? Well, going back to John's presentation, um, we need the bluffs to keep eroding. We need that erosion because that's how our beaches are formed, unlike other parts in the United States where they rely on river sediments. That's not how our beaches work. And so we need that erosion to occur for our beaches to be healthy. Now, over time, we've built bulkheads and uh, in different ways. So 100, 150 years ago, we would have pushed a bunch of, bunch of material out, backfilled, and created a nice flat space where the beach used to be where we could put a house. So like the bottom one here. And then later, we started pushing people back a little bit and saying, you know, maybe that's too much. And then more recently, uh, regulations more like, you need to go as far back as possible for any new bulkheads. And if in any way possible, it needs to be out of sort of the high tide area entirely. And part of that is because those forage fish, uh, like in the upper photo, they're slightly impacted by the bulk, newer bulkheads of today, but the bulkheads in, the, in sort of historic ones have a huge impact and basically displace most or all of the spawning habitat. And unfortunately in the King County area, a lot of the shoreline armoring went in over 40 years ago and people now live there and repair them in those places. So it, it we have a lot less spawning habitat than we used to. When you look at uh, sort of our shoreline, we used to have a lot of pictures like on the lower left where this maple is hanging out 30, 40, 50 feet over the shoreline. And if you look at the shoreline and look at where it's armored and where you have overhanging trees, you basically do, you see overhanging trees when you don't have armor. And that's not too surprising. People have a tendency to sort of landscape and try to create views and armor generally means a house. But you really don't see a lot of overhanging trees when you have armor. So this picture on the right, the only thing overhanging that upper beach are the cars that are driving on that particular beach. So it is a dramatic shift in that upper beach. We also see wood collecting along the shoreline very differently in these areas. And so when you don't see wood on the beach, almost always it's armored. And then you find different types of uh, 
would when it isn't armored. So you have a typical drift log accumulation like here at Marine View Park, or you may have sort of like this over at Piner Point where there's lots of trees coming down and they're still somewhat anchored by their roots and hanging out into the shoreline. These mostly occur in areas that are unarmored. So this recent UW study that was done, really comprehensive and actually included a large portion of King County in the data collection and analysis. And they found that armored beaches are on average 15 to 30 feet smaller than unarmored beaches. And you can see this shot from West Seattle where the historically uh, older bulkheads that go way out in the inner tidal, there's no wood. You have this one gap in the middle between the structures where you could see wood on the shoreline and, and some amount of beach at low tide. So big impact overall when you look at, uh, at the scale of big areas. You also see that from that same study that the drift log accumulation areas are about 15 feet skinnier on average when they do exist on armored beaches compared to this unarmored beach at Point Robinson. That same study also looked at the material, the beach rack or the debris that builds up like the seaweed and the eelgrass bits and then the trees and leaves that dump on the shoreline. And so this is what we would call detritus and it slowly rots, but this is really important stuff. This is a separate little food chain occurring right here. And we have things like these teltrid amphipods that'll stay in the upper inner tidal They'll chew up the eelgrass and the little bits of stuff that are up there, and they, be, they make that food available to various other things. And yet they're also food for marine birds and occasionally fish. They, they're pretty smart for an invertebrate and they stay out of the water for the most part. But if you ever flip up, flip up some algae and see things start popping everywhere, that's these guys. And so these are beach hoppers is another name for them. The same UW set of study, studies at UW also saw that when you have armor, you're more likely to see crows and gulls. You're less likely to see songbirds along your shoreline. And you are pretty much not going to see shorebirds, true shorebirds along your shoreline because of the type of habitats that they use. This is from a study done in 2006 up in the San Juans. Um, I'll break it down in a moment. It's a really nice study. Basically, the researcher looked at an armored beach, an adjacent unarmored beach with trees, and compared the two. So he put some little gauges out to look at light intensity and temperature. And what he found in that study was that the armored beaches get a lot more sunlight, which means it warms up a lot more on the armored beach. It also means that the substrate itself is warming up, not just the air over the beach. And then it also dries out the beach quite a bit, which lead, led to basically fried forage fish eggs. So the eggs spawned on the uh, armored beach died, and the, but the eggs on the unarmored beach immediately next door were just fine. So mostly talked about sort of the fish and wildlife kind of thing, but I also wanted to put a little uh, note out there about your neighbors. So armor can also impact your neighbors, not just you and not just the environment. So there's a group of things we call end effects of armor, especially when it sticks out pretty far. It, when wave energy hits at an angle, like John showed, it'll be reflected back onto the shore and it can create erosion um, on the side and in front. So it can coarsen and move all the fine sediment away and can actually undermine your wall as it slowly chews away the sediment over time. There's another issue, which as John showed the longshore effect of sediment movement, if your bulkhead is structured this way, it can actually capture sediment from one side and starve it from the other side. So your one neighbor might be very happy with you, while your other neighbor might be very unhappy with you, um, kind of thing, because they're starting, they're basically experiencing the erosion. And then on your own bulkhead, you could still see as the waves hit, like a normal headland, the waves will wrap around and they can actually undermine your bulkhead from behind. So there's all these different effects that bulkheads, how they interact with wave energy that aren't always what people intended when they put the structure out there to protect the shoreline sort of thing from erosion, they can actually facilitate erosion. And so most people think about their neighbors like, oh, my neighborhood is right here. But in the context of the marine shoreline, you should think about your neighbors based on what drift cell that you live in because that's the actual, your neighborhood where 
anything you do may impact the people downdrift of you in the sort of longshore transport and things that people do updrift of you may impact you. And so all of you are sort of interrelated and truly a neighborhood, um, not just say the small section of Gold Beach or Sunset Shores or over here, it's the whole drift cell is your neighborhood. And you need to think about your effects on your neighbors. So bulkheads, have a lot of negative side effects. Are there other alternatives at this point to hard armor structures? Yes, there are actually quite a few different alternatives that are available. Uh, there's two nice documents that have come out in the last few years. One soft, uh, called Soft Shrine Stabilization from Department of Ecology. The other one is the Marine Shore Design Guidelines from Department of Fish and Wildlife. And they all look at sort of this range of sort of the, the historic way of hard armor structures two softer approaches that mimic nature a little bit more. The Marine Shore Design Guidelines is a, about a two to 300 page document. It's a little bit dense, a little technical, uh, but it has a lot of great information in it. So it has bases, a lot of stuff that John covered about geology. It covers stuff about site assessment and risk assessment and coastal processes assessment that things that the conservation district can help you with if you ask for technical assistance. But if you're like, I don't want assistance, I'll do it myself. This is a great place to start because it really walks you through the steps and also goes through what might work in your circumstances. So in some cases, bulkhead is the only thing that's uh, going to be the answer for how your property is structured. But in other cases, there are other options. And this document goes through that. There's a user-friendly, a little bit more picture-oriented version called Your Marine Waterfront. Um, it's very easy to read. The Marine Shore Design Guidelines, anyone can read it and you just may take you a while to get through it. So what are the alternatives to bulkheads? So in some cases, they're just not needed at all. And you can just remove them. In this case, the bulkhead is more of a picnic area, more of maybe a place to launch a boat, hand launch, but it's not providing any uh, protection to the house. And so this is mostly just one where um, it's a little less necessary. You can also move your structure that might be at risk back versus putting in armor. And so this was done in this case here at Docton Park where the boat uh, shed here was starting to be impacted. And instead of trying to rebuild the bulkhead, they just dragged the structure back. But you can also relocate up if you're sort of getting flooded. And that's what this house that was getting uh, impacted by high tides did a while ago, where it's now actually about three feet above the flood elevation. It may not look like it here, but it actually was raised and they have some screening around the bottom so you can't tell that it's up on pilings. Uh, but this house is, has been raised. There's also a lot of different ways that you can use wood in the shoreline. This particular example here is a bit of more of a heavy hand compared to a lighter touch. This is up in Anacortes. Uh, so this is a little bit more of a lighter touch where they brought in some logs to help sort of try and uh, hold on to some of the sediment in the upper beach and allow for the dune grass to establish behind it. Now, another component of Another option is a, uh, something we call beach nourishment. So if the beach is being starved by bulkheads and not enough sediment deposition, we could re-nourish the beach. Now, in this case, the landowner did a repair job to their bulkhead and Department of Fish and Wildlife required as part of the permit for them to do some beach nourishment. In this case, it was a relatively small amount of nourishment in the upper shoreline, and they require that you use really small material, things that forage fish could use. So this is typically called a fish mix of gravel versus larger stuff. But you can also go a lot bigger when it comes to beach nourishment. So here's an example of a site that was eroding up at Weaverling Spit, and this is the before shot. And this is after, sorry, it's from the other direction, but basically the bulkhead has now been removed. They have some logs in there to help sort of limit how much material moves away from the site along shore, but you have a real beach. This is a shot at Dockin Park on, on Maury Island before the bulkhead was removed. And then after the bulkhead was removed along here. Now we actually have enough space for beach rack to build up, wood starting to build up on site. The beach has shifted inland a little bit in response to sort of adjusting. And this is the type of thing that we would like to see. Now, this is one of the more uh, older beach nourishment sites in Puget Sound done on Samish Beach. 
And one of the things to keep in mind with beach nourishment is that sometimes, depending on your size of property, it's not an easy solution for your, just you, and you may need your neighbors to join you. And this site is one where 15 to 20 neighbors got together and said, we're tired of falling off this bulkhead. It's starting to collapse again. Our kids can't get down it safely to the beach. What are our options? And the group went together and put in a beach nourishment project. This photo right here, the chimney up here, is the same chimney right here. So you can see that bulkhead's gone. They can walk out their back door, walk to the beach, and walk right out onto the beach. No stairs, no tripping, none of it. And this has been in place now for well over 20 years and has been performing beautifully. So people think that you need the hard structure for something to be stable over the long term, and this isn't the case. You can actually have your beach sort of form and reform on wave energy, as John sort of said, getting at that equilibrium. And this is a really great example of neighbors getting together to offer a much better environmental and better personal sort of aesthetic and access to the beach. If you're looking, if you're local and you lie, I don't want to go to Samish. Uh, Seahurst Park had a large uh, beach nourishment project done about five, six years ago. And this is right as they were finishing it up. So instead of using wood as sort of a means of trying to hold sediment in, they put in a rock sill here. So right along the edge here, and all of this uh, gravel was imported in. As you can see, the downdrift side is very coarse compared to the updrift side. And this is right after it was built. So it looks a little different now. Uh, but even in downtown Seattle, where it's about as degraded as you could be from a fish point of view, there are still options available to you if you have the ability. And so in this case, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, the Olympic Sculpture Park created a small pocket beach. They took out the armor that used to span across the photo here, and they created this nice pocket beach. Now, me as a biologist, I was very skeptical that this was gonna make any difference whatsoever. Um, and I mean, really skeptical, but it has. The UW's been studying this thing a lot and they actually show a lot of different use of this small area by juvenile salmon and forage fish compared to the bulkhead just to the north, so or south, sorry. So this is a really great, um, great example of even the most degraded environments. And I'm just gonna sort of make a quick plug for the shore friendly, King, King Shore Friendly program. So this program is really new, is really launching this year, and it has potentially the, the opportunity if you have a bulkhead and think you might want to go soft or get rid of it, this program can help pay for that to happen. And they'll do site assessments, walk you through what might be possible, the options, and may be able to fund much of the removal. So this is a brand new program. Uh, if you sign up for technical assistance at the end, they may send you to this program versus the KCD's regular program. Uh, but either way, you'll get some technical assistance, but this one may provide some means to help finance some removal. And with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and hand this over to John to talk a little bit more about the Upland side. And when he's done, we'll answer questions on both topics. So Colin, talked uh, a lot about some of the human impacts to, uh, to uh, some of the impacts of humans living uh, right on the beach. Uh, and I wanted to chat a little bit about uh, some of the issues associated with living um, either above, below, or, or on coastal bluffs. So looking at the back part of that check mark that we talked about earlier. Um, <clears throat> I'd mentioned that um, uh, the most, the dominant process by which blow, bluffs erode is landsliding. Um, this was a, a pie chart that was prepared by, um, as part of a study that was done by Shannon and Wilson looking at landslides in Seattle. Uh, most of these landslides, by the way, were on the coastal bluffs in Seattle. Um, <clears throat> what they found was that 84% of the landslides had some kind of human cause or human influence. Uh, only about 13% were, were natural. Um, point of this slide is to, is to um, recognize that bluffs are inherently kind of metastable. Bluffs are typically uh, eroding slowly on their own. And most of the things, unfortunately, that people do to bluffs or on bluffs um, tend to accelerate that erosion. So most of what people do on bluffs is to speed up the natural, the natural rate of er er erosion that's occurring there. Um, and let's look at some of the ways that people do that. Uh, so the most common 
I mean, human contributions, human alterations uh, that increase landsliding are, first of all, inappropriate vegetation management. And stay tuned because Elliot's going to talk about that uh, in a bit here. The second one is inappropriate water management. Um, and thirdly is inappropriate fill or, or debris placement. Um, so those are really the three main things that that people do that increase uh, decrease stability on on slopes and, uh, and on bluffs. Um, so let's talk first of all about kind of water discharge onto slopes and we'll start talking about surface water which is the biggest issue and basically surface water is all of that water that uh, rainfall that lands on the ground surface that doesn't soak in that drains across the land surface and then of concern here would be if that water drains over a steep slope somehow. Um, and one of the things that uh, it's important to recognize is that again, human occupation of the landscape has dramatically increased the amount of surface water that's generated. Uh, so this graphic was uh, prepared by um, uh, Wazoo Extension. And what they, what they show here is that uh, kind of what happens to precipitation when it lands on the ground. So the, um, the blue area here is water that uh, lands on the ground and then is returned to the atmosphere by evapotranspiration. So it's absorbed by plants and carried back into the atmosphere. Uh, the kind of tan area here is what's called interflow. That's water that soaks into the ground at a shallow depth and moves laterally through the soil downslope and emerges as, uh, as springs further downslope. And then this darker brown is water that soaks into the ground and goes into deep groundwater, the kind of groundwater that might be accessed by, um, by wells for drinking water, for example. Um, and the red here is surface water. So that's water that lands on the ground surface and, and flows off the ground surface, never soaks in at all. And what you see here, what's important in this slide is that in a forested condition in the Pacific Northwest under pristine conditions, there's no red on this, on this bar chart. All of the water that landed on the ground was either returned to the atmosphere by vegetation or soaked into the ground uh, with some very minor exceptions, there was no water running across the surface of the ground, even during a very intense rainfall. Uh, but then we as humans showed up and one of the, one of the big uh, modifications we make to the landscape is adding impervious surface. And impervious surface, of course, is anything that doesn't allow water to soak in. So it could be a parking lot, a roof, a sidewalk. Um, even even uh, lawns in some cases um, don't allow water to soak in. And so water runs off of those uh, surfaces very quickly. So water running off of a, of a parking lot may reach a stormwater system, flow through the stormwater system and be discharged in a matter of, uh, of hours, minutes or hours. Whereas that same water falling on a pristine landscape um, might take uh, weeks or months before it reached a receiving water. So um, with this increase in surface water, we've increased the, the, the volume of water that is discharged, particularly during storm events. Um, and so if we look here at this at the same uh, figure, we see that in, in, a, in a city, the vast majority of water that falls, precipitation that falls, uh, runs off as surface runoff. And that's, that's new. That's something that wasn't there uh, before humans intervened. <clears throat> so we need to be concerned about what happens to the surface water, uh, whether you live at the, at the top of slope up here and you may be generating or transmitting surface water down to the bluff, or especially if you live at the bottom and you may be receiving um, the surface water that drains down and whatever comes down with it. Um, now, often if you live right at the top of slope, it's difficult to kind of safely discharge your stormwater to find a way of getting it down the slope without having it cause uh, damage or erosion. Um, one kind of obvious solution to that is to pick up the water in some kind of a pipe and just convey it over the slope uh, so that it, it runs over the slope in a pipe and it doesn't, doesn't touch the ground, doesn't cause any erosion or landsliding. Um, and, uh, and an option for doing that is to use the, this material. This is called ADS pipe. Um, and this stuff is uh, not only readily available, it's inexpensive. So this figure is a little bit old, but uh, 
but that may be a few dollars now more now, but for a hundred feet of this stuff back then it was uh, $73. So that is, it's really a very cost-effective way of addressing this problem, except that ADS pipe actually doesn't really work very well for that application. Um, ADS pipe is, is very flexible, uh, it's very weak, um, and the joints in particular, it's really difficult to make a strong joint in ADS pipe where you have to join two pieces together. Um, so not only have this kind of situation where the, where the uh, pipe is, is deformed, twisted and kinked, but a common circumstance is where you have the water draining over a slope in an ADS pipe, the pipe separates, it either breaks um, or a joint separates. And now all of a sudden you have water um, not being discharged to the base of slope, but being discharged right on the slope, kind of in, in the worst possible place. Um, and not infrequently with an outcome like this, where that, uh, where that discharge may actually initiate a landslide. And then one of the other issues with ADS pipe uh, is just the, the amount of it that we see as beach trash. Um, if you walk around any beaches in areas where your people are occupying in urban or suburban areas um, below bluffs, you just, you see this ADS pipe um, all over the beaches. My subjective observation is that of all of the plastic debris on the beaches, there's probably more ADS pipe than anything else. Um, and this is again, a consequence of the fact that people use it on the bluff and it fails and, and ends up on the beach. Um, there is a better solution um, for this kind of conveyance. Um, uh, it's called, rather than ADS pipe, this is called HDPE pipe, high density polyethylene pipe. Um, and uh, this material is much thicker, whereas uh, the ADS pipe is just kind of a little more than paper thin. This, this pipe may be a uh, quarter to a half inch thick. It's plastic. And the machine that you see here actually shaves off the end of the pipe, heats it up and glues it together. So the joints in this pipe are uh, a result of melting the pipe together and they are essentially as strong as the pipe. Um, this material is extraordinarily robust. Um, this, is, uh, this is an HDPE uh, pipe from a residence uh, on Hood Canal, Port Ludlow area. Uh, it's been in place for about 20 years. Uh, you can see it's draining over a rapidly eroding, very unstable bluff. Um, and it basically hangs over the bluff, hangs from the top, um, and it's been unaffected by the, by the ongoing and dramatic um, instability uh, on that bluff. Um, Here's an energy dissipator discharge at the, at the bottom of that pipe. Um, so if you're in a cir circumstance where discharging water over a bluff is, uh, is, the, is the best option, uh, looking into an HDPE uh, discharge system uh, is, is a much better option than trying to, trying to use ADS pipe. Um, in some circumstances, uh, there may be uh, issues where you're dealing with not surface water, but groundwater, um, water that infiltrates into the ground and then emerges as seepage on the slope. And often, if that's the case, the problem that you're dealing with is a deep-seated landslide. Um, and so one of the ways of addressing uh, preventing movement of a deep-seated landslide is to try and get the water out of it. Um, there are some Oh, well, let's see, one way that people sometimes try and do that relatively inexpensively is to build interceptor trenches or French drains uh, above the area that they're concerned about. Um, while sometimes that can be an effective um, approach, um, it has the difficulty, what often happens is people will excavate a trench, fill it with uh, gravel and perforated pipe, water flows into that, but then kind of reaches a low spot in the pipe um, infiltrates out of the trench at that point and then emerges essentially as a point source of infiltration um, and then discharges to the slope below. So you have a point source of infiltration, increased um, seepage on that point and potentially uh, increase in uh, potentially initiating a landslide at that spot. Um, for even deeper groundwater and in particular where you're trying to stabilize a uh, uh, a deep seated landslide, um, there are a variety of drainage techniques that are available. Um, none of them are inexpensive or trivial to install. 
Um, you can put in a, a vertical drain. This is basically like a traditional, you know, a drinking water well. Um, you can drill that straight down. Of course, you have to pump water out of that. So that's an ongoing expense. Um, if you can access the base of slope, you can put in what's called a horizontal drain. So there's a drill rig that actually drills horizontally into the slope. You can put a perforated pipe in that, uh, in that hole and try and drain water out of it. Um, and if, thing, if you can't get to the bottom of the slope and you need to drain this, there's actually uh, some machines that are called directional drilling machines. They can sit up here and steer the drill bit as, uh, as a drill goes down um, so that it reaches the beach face down here. Um, all of these methods, as, as you might imagine, are expensive. Um, they're not always successful. Sometimes they're difficult to, to get water into these. Um, Bottom line there is that while these approaches may be sort of the only option if you have a deep seated landslide that you need to stabilize, um, for example, if you've already got a house or a neighborhood on it, um, far better option is just to avoid, uh, avoid building or developing, recognizing those deep seated landslides and avoid, uh, avoid building on them. Uh, and then just a, a comment uh, again about uh, discharging surface water um, in the kind of stormwater uh, management field, if you will, um, in the last uh, decade or so, uh, there's been the development of an idea called uh, um, low impact development or LID uh, stormwater development. Um, and this is an example of that. Um, and basically the idea is that rather than traditionally dealing with stormwater, you collected it all, conveyed it in pipes into ponds and then threw more pipes out to a stream or a receiving water. Uh, the idea behind low impact development is that you collect stormwater where you need to, but then as quickly as possible, you put it into some kind of an infiltration facility like this, allow it to soak back into the ground and try and restore some of that natural, um, um, some, of the, some of the natural characteristics of, uh, of uh, precipitation and groundwater recharge that we saw under pristine conditions. Um, and this is overall a great idea. It's got lots of benefits over more traditional stormwater management. Um, the caution here is that while this is a good technique, not something you want to do kind of immediately at the, at the top of a, of a steep slope or a, um, a shoreline bluff. And the concern again is the possibility of kind of concentrating uh, infiltration uh, causing increased seepage on the slope below and potentially initiating uh, landsliding. So overall, a, a, often a great approach to dealing with stormwater, probably not one that's appropriate if you're in the immediate proximity uh, to the top of, a, um, top of a steep bluff. So that was a little bit of a discussion about stormwater surface water issues. Let's talk a little bit about fill placement on or near bluffs. Um, here's an example, kind of a cartoon showing a real typical sort of dilemma that a builder might have or have had in the past when they were building a house uh, near the top of a bluff. A great spot for a house there, beautiful view. Um, but the builder really has two problems with this house. Um, one is that he's excavated a lot of fill for the basement and he's got to put it somewhere. Uh, and the second problem he has is there really is no place on this house to have barbecues, play croquet, uh, lawn tennis, whatever, uh, because there isn't a nice flat flat area of lawn. Um, but there's a way of addressing both of those problems. You just take all of the uh, soil that was excavated when you, uh, when you built the house and you just build yourself a nice uh, little platform here behind the house um, that you can put, uh, put lawn on and play badminton. Um, the problem with that, of course, occurs when that wedge of material becomes saturated at some point. It's often kind of not keyed into the slope, not structurally protected, and that material can fall off. This is a really very common circumstance under which we have um, failures in residential areas at the top of slope. And this is usually what that looks like. So uh, what probably the homeowners thought was a stable backyard was actually composed of fill. Um, became saturated and failed. Um, and, and as you can see here, probably some of the failure was contributed by the fact that there were um, various, I don't know what, uh, maybe septic systems or, or um, uh, downspouts, whatever, water that was supplied from the residents to this. Really common circumstance. Unfortunately, and I, I 
I think it's probably true that both builders and uh, the people who deal with um, permitting new construction are now aware of this uh, uh, hazard. And largely, I don't think it happens in new construction um, uh, for the most part. It is still common on older residences to have this situation uh, existing. So if you live in a house that was built in the, you know, maybe 50s, 60s, 70s, um, you may have this circumstance behind your house. Um, you may want to take a look at that. As a minimum, you want to make sure that you're not discharging surface water and in particular, say, the runoff from your driveway or your downspouts onto this area. You don't want to uh, put too much irrigation water back there. Um, if you start to see movement, if you start to see cracking or displacement or settling uh, in that area between your house and the top of slope, you may well be looking at this kind of a circumstance. Um, it is both unfortunately difficult and expensive to stabilize this. Um, really your only option at that point is to retain the services of a geotechnical uh, engineer or firm and look at, uh, look at whether or not there's the potential for building a structural retaining wall or in some other way, stabilizing that massive material. Another issue with fill placement on slopes uh, that's also very, very common is a lot of people get rid of landscaping debris over slopes. Um, it's really common, lawn clippings, uh, you know, branches, whatever, blackberry brambles. Um, and people often think that, you know, kind of um, out of sight, out of mind, if they just dump it over the slope and they can't see it, that it's okay. And some people even have, have an idea, which seems kind of credible, that that material acts as some sort of a natural mulch and that maybe it's even good for the slope. Uh, the reality is what, what happens often is that material becomes this kind of sodden mass. Um, when it becomes saturated, uh, that blob of uh, landscaping debris starts sliding downhill. And then as it starts sliding, it will often carry a chunk of the, of the hillside with it as you, um, as you see in this case. Um, it's a common problem. And in fact, not this slide, but one quite close to here uh, that initiated as, uh, as uh, landscaping disposal on the top of slope ended up being one of the landslides that closed the um, railroad tracks between Seattle and Everett, uh, one, of the, one of the times that that happened. Um, so don't use slopes, don't use steep slopes, don't use bluffs as an area for disposing of refuse of any kind. Um, landscaping debris, uh, old Christmas trees, um, get rid of that in a, more, in a more appropriate location. Now let's talk a little bit uh, about bulkheads and, and beaches and, and bluffs. Colin talked about some of this already, but I just go back and um, reiterate a little of what Colin said. Um, first of all, uh, you know, we talked about the fact that a, a wave breaking on the beach dissipates its energy as it uh, as it advances up the beach and then um, returns via swash of very low energy uh, as it drains back down the beach. As Colin said, if you have a vertical bulkhead here, rather than just draining back down the beach, that wave energy is reflected. Uh, and when it's reflected, it has a lot more energy moving back towards the water and, uh, and often um, carries more sediment back down. Again, the beach is not in equilibrium. It starts to erode, it starts to coarsen. One of the things that you see over and over again with, uh, with retaining walls like this or bulkheads like this is the beach level drops, uh, the toe of the bulkhead becomes exposed, and then you have to do another iteration of protection at the toe of this. And there's some circumstances where you'll see um, structures like this that have had three or four different iterations of toe protection as the beach dropped in front of these in front of these features. You can see two here. So there was the uh, concrete wall installed and then riprap uh, placed in, in front of the wall. Um, so one concern with, uh, with bulkheads is that they affect the beach in front of them. Um, the other one, again, Colin alluded to this, is uh, our beaches here in the Pacific Northwest are the, the primary sediment source to the beaches that forms the beaches is sediment that's generated um, by erosion of the bluff. And if you install a bulkhead, you interrupt that supply and again, potentially lead to coarsening of the beach and potentially impacts not only to the area where the bulkhead's uh, installed, but to properties that are downdrift. 
often bulkheads are installed with the idea that they're going to stabilize the slope, that they're going to prevent damage to houses or, or other infrastructure upslope. Um, here again, we see the, the slide in Magnolia um, bulkhead at the toe of slope. And, and clearly in this case, um, it's not working to protect the slope uh, to prevent landsliding. Um, and that's often perhaps uh, typically the case. Uh, bulkheads are usually not high enough or robust enough to significantly impact the, the bluff processes that are leading to bluff retreat. Uh, and just to sort of illustrate that a little bit, I'm gonna take a hypothetical situation, but imagine a circumstance like this where you have a, a high bluff that's quite steep. Um, and imagine that that's, that starting bluff face is on the order of maybe 70 degrees, which would be really typical. Some people would look at that and say it was vertical, but uh, bluffs are almost never vertical. They usually have some, some um, uh, setback angle. Here in the Pacific Northwest, typically a relatively stable natural slope may have an inclination of about 35 degrees. You often see slopes in this range, um, natural slopes that have, have reached this and, and the rate of, of retreat or erosion slows way down at that point. Um, if you imagine that the bluff is 100 feet high and you do a little bit of trigonometry, what you find is that you're gonna have to have 106 feet of retreat at the top of slope. Uh, before you get to a point where the, where the erosion rate is gonna slow way down. So even if you put a bulkhead here at the toe of slope, um, you've still got over a period of time, a lot of bluff retreat that's gonna happen uh, even if the toe of the, uh, of the slope is fixed in place. Um, and there's actually a great example of that uh, around here. Um, the, the, late part of the 1800s, uh, the Great Northern Railway built the um, railroad line that runs north from Seattle up towards Everett. Um, and this I think was uh, uh, some additional construction of that, of that seawall in 1906. That seawall was extremely well built, big blocks of, of granite from the South Fork Skykomish River, um, well jointed, deep, um, and, uh, and it's, it's been in place for a long time and it's worked extremely well. Um, um, carried, the, carried the train tracks for more than a century there. Um, but even though the toe of slope is protected by this very, very robust structure, uh, we know that over the years, the bluff above, what was the original beach bluff now above the railroad tracks uh, has been subject and continues to be subject to um, damaging landslides. Um, even though the, even though the um, railroad tracks and the uh, bulkhead protect the toe from, uh, from wave impact and retreat. Um, so again, just to summarize a couple of, uh, a couple of the take home points uh, from that, one is that bluffs are inherently in unstable. And if you live on or near a bluff, it's important to kind of recognize that, um, that first of all, um, if, if you see the bluff eroding, um, it's not necessarily a catastrophe. It may just be natural process at work. Um, but lots of things people do can increase that instability um, by altering water discharge over the slope, by adding fill, or by changes in vegetation. Um, and that um, the bulkheads at the toe of slope are typically not a uh, uh, or at least of limited value in preventing those processes from, from occurring.